President Joe Biden is now walking down uh, the stairs of the Air Force One. Uh, the president is being received uh, by VK Singh uh, as a representative of the Indian government. But there are, of course, the U.S. ambassador to India who is also there at uh, the airport. You see, I think that's J.V. Shergal who is also there. Uh, no, that's somebody else. But VK Singh uh, is obviously there as a representative of the Indian government, uh, welcoming the U.S. president to India. The U.S. ambassador to India, the new one, who has obviously just started a few months ago, is also there at the airport. Uh, this is going to be a brief introduction and uh, a few statements exchanged uh, at the New Delhi airport before the president uh, gets into what is referred to as the beast, uh, his vehicle, and goes to 7 LKM uh, for that bilateral uh, with the Indian Prime Minister. The president uh, also meeting a young girl there. They seem to know each other from before. And yes, so pleasantries being exchanged. The President of the United States has landed in the national capital. This is of course ahead of G20 summit. But there is a bilateral to look forward to that's happening just this evening in just about an hour's time from now. Yes, Max, sorry to interrupt you there. You can finish your thought. Yes, so, you know, the United States is really prioritizing this relationship for all sorts of reasons, economically, yes, but of course, this relationship is happening in the shadow of growing American concerns that so-called mm. unipolarity, you know, post-Cold War, the condition where the United States was seen as the world's premier hegemonic power is obviously, you know, contested mm -hmm. and challenged. There's an obvious rise of China. We've been expecting this for a long time, but it really, over the past decade, has come to fruition. The United States views China as a, or views India as a bulwark against China. Um, so, for all of these reasons, economic but also military, the U.S.-India relationship is extraordinarily important. I think it's interesting that she is not present mm -hmm. at this summit. And I think that the Americans are gonna try to exploit this and try to show not just India, but also the global South, the mm. rest of the international community, that they should side more with the United States than, than with China. Mm. Um, I think that she's omission from this summit um, is a very important aspect of it. And the United States is gonna try to exploit it. Yes. Well, it's not just Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, who's uh, not going to be present. The Chinese premier is in town. But it's also, of course, Russian president Vladimir Putin, uh, who's not coming for the G20 summit either. And precisely what Max has been talking about, uh, you know, there's this growing discomfort between the West bloc and China and Russia together. We will talk about that in just a bit. But Daniel, I want to come to you with that question. In fact, uh, the absence of Russia and Chinese president is that going to take away too much from the G20 summit? Or do you feel that this is something that was expected, is on expected lines, and it shouldn't deter the rest of the countries to make the best out of this summit? Obviously, the other countries have agendas that they'll want to advance. Uh, and to some extent, uh, I don't think that the absence of either of these countries' leaders uh, would necessarily preclude that. Uh, I do think we should separate the two. Uh, the absence of Putin was something that was widely anticipated. Uh, we all know that um, this uh, was gearing up to be already a divisive uh, uh, summit uh, on, as a consequence of Russia's aggression in Ukraine um, and the differences of opinion over that. Um, and Putin's uh, position in all of that made his attendance uh, very difficult, if not impossible. And so that was fully expected. But Xi's uh, decision not mm. to come which has not been fully explained uh, publicly uh, to, to the world um, and was not really previewed uh, up until the last few days is a surprise. I think it was uh, at least in part um, intended to be a snub uh, to India. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not um, that will, it will land that way is, is a different issue. Um, and precisely why she has chosen not to come is also not entirely clear. It may have domestic or other uh, reasons behind it. So we simply don't know at this point. Um, it will, I think, um, make India's life in some ways a little bit easier mm -hmm. uh, because bridging the gap between the positions of Russia and China versus uh, the so-called West uh, and the global South, uh, India will um, you know, have to 
have a little bit less of a, of a bridging act to play. Mm -hmm. um, but we should remember that the Chinese delegation will be there, even if she won't be there. Yes. Uh, the rest will be there, and they can still uh, try to obstruct uh, progress, particularly on the Ukraine issue, on a joint statement, mm. uh, and a variety of other things. So it doesn't eliminate the challenge, um, but some of the, the photographs <laughs> were bound to be uncomfortable yes. uh, had she been there, and some of that will be made a bit easier. Uh, in fact, on the joint statement, uh, I want to go across to Madhav, Professor Madhav as well. You know, that's the one big thing that everybody is watching out for. Uh, it's expected on Sunday at the end of the summit meet. Uh, but it could be in doldrums. It is in doubt. Uh, given that uh, we've not had that statement being agreed upon by all nations, the Ukraine-Russia war is casting a very wide shadow on any kind of a joint statement. Do you believe that any kind of a New Delhi statement is possible at all? Look, uh, I'd like to say very clearly that we have to look at it from the point of view of how democracies look at things. As far as India and the United States are concerned, long before there were close government-to-government -government relations, there were close people-to-people -people relations. Hmm. And there's a very vibrant Indian-American community that has contributed a lot to that. There are tens of millions of, of people in India who have extensive linkages to the United States. So it's a, it's, it's a relationship that has grown from the ground up. It's not been imposed from the top down. President Biden sent one of his closest personal friends, uh, Ambassador Garcetti, hmm. as the envoy to India. He did that because Ambassador Garcetti has a direct line to President Biden. Hmm. And he did that as a mark of his understanding that India is a critical partner in the Indo-Pacific. We're talking about defense. The reality is that U.S. Uh, you know, defense companies will need to, to, to base a lot of their you know, plans and production in India if they are to compete in the global market with what is likely to be a coming together of Russian and Chinese uh, defense technologies. So that is a very, very important uh, aspect in which both sides will benefit. Technology. You look at all the major technology centers in the United States. I've gone to some of them. And believe me, sometimes I believe I'm back in India. You, you, you hardly see anyone who is not ethnically Indian. Of course, they're all American, but they're all ethnically Indian. So the reality is these two democracies are finally coming together at the top. And may I say that as soon as the Prime Minister Modi came, all the four agreements that basically are the foundation for India-U.S. defense and security cooperation hmm. were signed under Prime Minister Modi. India has joined the Quad. And let's not kid ourselves when we are talking about a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. It means we are protecting the Indo-Pacific from powers that don't want a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Okay. So from all points of view, the two biggest democracies coming together, the leaders of the two having a nice dinner uh, at, at basically at the home of the Prime Indian Minister. Prime Minister, yes. whereas previously it was the home of the U.S. President. I think it's very meaningful, not just for in terms of a statement. This is a statement. And in my view, as a common citizen, not as a experienced, if I may say so, civil servant or bureaucrat, I'd like to say that for me, this is what counts. Okay.